from the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters tonight. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. If you want to take a listen to our archives, they are free for you at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire and much more. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter for the show at Spaced Out Radio and my personal handle at Dave Scott SOR. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. David Weatherly is considered one of the most knowledgeable researchers and authors of the strange and supernatural. He has traveled around the world in pursuit of ghosts, cryptids, UFOs, magic, looking for answers that seem impossible to find. But the journey continues. From the specters of dusty castles to remote haunted islands, ancient sites, modern mysteries, David has journeyed to the most unusual places on the globe, seeking the unknown. His website eerielights.com if you want to check it on out i highly suggest you do then at the bottom of hour number three i will bring you the sor newswire brought to you by paranoia magazine mr david weatherly every couple of months you grace our studio here with your dulcet tones and your intriguing stories man it's good to have you back on oh good evening Dave scott it's good to be on i gotta ask you dave you know you've been doing this for 40 years now, 30, 40 years now, you have created this niche for yourself where you get to, you know, see the world investigating the unknown. How did you build a life like that for yourself, man? Because so many people would look at that and say, I want to be able to do that. Why haven't I been able to do that? How did you come across that? Oh, man, that probably goes back to the old uh, Joseph Campbell adage, follow your bliss. You know, people people have asked me before how I got into this stuff, and you know, sometimes it's uh, sometimes I got a long version of the story, and <laughs> sometimes there's a short version. Uh, but you know, really, it's uh, I, I tell people the path kind of found me as much as I found it, and you know what I mean by that is that I got interested in the unusual when I was very young, uh, hearing. You know, my grandmother told ghost stories and uh, things like that. It just had me fascinated when I was a little kid. And by the time I was uh, in my early teens, you know, I was uh, was always a big reader. And I got to date myself a little bit here and say, you know, I was born in the 60s. So uh, by the early 70s, you know, I was, I was reading everything I could get my hands on. This was a uh, pre-internet age for, you know, those who can comprehend that. <laughs> you know, you didn't uh, you didn't get to sit down and, and just type in UFOs or cryptids or whatever. You had to, you know, find whatever information you could. So for me, you know, I just got really interested in this stuff as uh, as a child and and started reading everything I could get my hands on. And uh, by the time I was a teenager, I started actively investigating uh, because I was kind of following the model of uh, what I discovered. You know, I discovered books. I discovered Fate Magazine, which was uh, originally uh, began publication in the 1940s. And it's still published to today. It's a little digest size magazine, and it has a whole range of articles about everything from haunted locations to UFOs to ancient mysteries, psychic phenomena, you name it, it's in there. And it's kind of curious, you know. this is this is one of those things that I talk about the path kind of finding me or the interest kind of finding me because I grew up in the country in the south and when uh, when we moved to this location uh, my dad built a house and it was you know down a country road and after being there oh I don't know a, a couple of years or so. Uh, these people came and, and built a house very close to ours, just a couple of, uh, there's a patch of woods between our house and theirs. And it turned out to be an elderly couple. And I discovered that the the woman 
was a spiritualist. Now, this was <laughs> this was Eastern North Carolina in the 1970s. You know, she was probably the only spiritualist for you know 100 miles or something. Who knows? And as a result, she had an interest in all kinds of interesting things, you know, uh, seances and, and you know, traditional spiritualism, uh, but also strange phenomena. And I actually discovered Fate Magazine because she was, she had one one day when I went over to visit her. And uh, I would go and talk to this lady after school and, uh, you know, have conversations about these things that I was interested in. And went to her house one day, and there sits an issue of Fate Magazine. And I picked it up, and I was just kind of blown away. Because, you know, here's a, a publication that has all these different articles and contributions from people. And it was sort of an eye-opening moment because I realized it was a different level to this area of interest I was developing. So this woman, you know, she told me, well, you know, make sure you visit tomorrow after school. And uh, I did. And when I got to her house the next day, she had this huge crate sitting out there. And she said, uh, I don't think I need these anymore, so why don't you take them? And they it was a crate full of fake magazine, like years worth. And, uh, oh, wow. man, I, I carted those home, those home. And uh, by just by sheer coincidence, you know, I, I, I think I felt sick the next day because – Oh, I was too ill to go to school for a couple of days, but I, I just, man, I, uh, I devoured those things and kind of never looked back from that point on, you know, because through this, I learned, oh, there are people who are out there, you know, capturing EVPs on recorders and, you know, there's all these different aspects that kind of opened up. And, uh, for me, that that was one of the turning points that made me realize, wow, there's a lot to this. And, uh, you know, as the years went on, I mean, I had, you know, I had a, a few regular jobs here and there, but I was always investigating and, and drawn to these things. And just over time developed, uh, the rest of my life around it in a sense. Uh, so I've been very fortunate, very blessed with being able to pursue these things. And, and the other interest that I developed along the way kind of fell within the same spectrum and allowed me to to continue to pursue my interest. I got to ask you, what was it like and how difficult was it pursuing these stories pre-internet age? Yeah, that's the that's I call that the PG era, pre-Google because uh, we had this little thing called libraries and, and bookstores and, you know, for, for your basic research information, that's where you had to go. Uh, if you were lucky, you could network with other people who had, had similar interests. But when it came to the investigative side, it was a whole different world because uh, we may have talked about this before on the show. You know, a lot of people take for granted now that it's easy to, get someone to share their story, their experience. Uh, but really, uh, that's fairly recent. And of course, you know, in a lot of communities now, and because I travel so much, there's still a lot of people who are reluctant to talk about these things. But overall, since the paranormal in general, and I use that in a very broad sense, since it's become a part of pop culture, you know, people are much more willing to discuss things now. But man, when I started this stuff, uh, it, it, it was not cool. You know, it was not, uh, it was not part of what people were, were really interested in, uh, on mass. And I, I always tell the joke that when I started doing this, if I went to a party and told people what I did, I was guaranteed a nice quiet evening alone, uh, you know, because you're like, Oh, this guy, you know, he's asking about Bigfoot and ghosts, you know, stay away from this guy. And uh, and now it's the polar opposite. If I go to a party and, and people find out what I do, you know, there's usually a line out the door because everyone has an, a story. Everyone has an experience they want to share. Uh, but, you know, I, I grew up in an era when this was uh, a very different um, challenge to get people to open up. And you had to, you had to find ways to relate to people. You had to to kind of get the inside track. You know, I, I developed as an investigator very much in the style of, of an investigative journalist because I learned how to uh, 
communicate with different communities and, you know, go into an area and find out, okay, who's the person I need to talk to, you know, where, where do I need to go to find stories? And of course, you know, some things become simple. I mean, there's always the old faithful that almost anywhere in the world you go, you know, you can, you can find a bar (laughs) or, you know, a tavern or something, and you're probably going to get into a conversation. You're probably going to hear some interesting things. Uh, you know, coffee shops work the same way. There's, there's different places that function in that way that people have a communal sense and they're more willing to open up. And of course, these days, like I said, it's much easier. Uh, but back in the, the 70s and the 80s, even, uh, it was it was much different. And as a result, you know, I, I developed a lot of different ways to listen to people, actively listen and to talk to people and to understand and develop a sense of, of when someone was being honest or being reluctant to share something or when they were just trying to you know, pull one over on me. I got to ask you, Dave, recently, as in a couple of weeks ago, there was an article on vicemagazine.com or vice.com about a lot of people staying at home right now and the numbers into the UFO research seem to be going up absolutely everywhere. You know, and the article asked a question, you know, a lot of people are wondering how to get into this field, how to find the proper research, how to find the proper people to learn from. When you have complete newbies in this field who come up to you or and, and say, how do I get started? How do I learn about this? Where should I start? What do you tell them? Right. So, and, and you're asking about UFOs specifically, uh, anything, but, you know, anything. this kind of, right. This, this pretty much applies to all aspects of, of the, you know, various fields of weirdness, whether it be UFOs or cryptids or ghosts. And I do get asked that question frequently, you know, there's a handful of things that I, I tell people has starting points. Uh, one thing I tell them <laughs> is, to, uh, especially if we're talking ghosts, but this applies to really all of the stuff again, uh, turn the television off. Uh, we have way too many people in this field who have based their investigative approach off of watching television. Now, this is not necessarily any, anything negative against the shows, but people seem to forget that reality television is television and it is entertainment. And, you know, I, I know people on most of the shows. Uh, some of these guys are, are 100% genuine. They're, they're good guys. They're, they're valid investigators. But what you're seeing when you sit down and watch a television show is it's not even one full hour. You're sitting there for an hour, but you take out the commercials. You've got about 40 minutes of little bits distilled down from the time they spent at a location. You're getting little snippets. And what you're seeing is not the investigative process. So, you know, I, I tell people to, to turn the television shows off or at least not base their approach on them. You know, uh, I tell people a lot of times, look, get off the internet, you know, don't, don't sit at home in front of the computer and call yourself an investigator. You know, if you're going to investigate, you need to actually investigate. You need to learn some basic tools. You need to learn some foundation. And, you know, I, I, it kind of disgusts me how little the modern era uh, of people read, you know, in fortunately within the topics we're talking about, a, a lot more people are, are reading more these days. Uh, it's good for writers like me, of course, but, you know, just in order to, uh, again, get your basic foundation and your knowledge, whether it's UFOs or, or ghosts or whatever it is, uh, you got to pick up some of the classics and read those and understand that, you know, these guys went out and beat the bushes. They went to the locations. They talked to witnesses. They, they did all this stuff. And that's where, that's where the value comes in and learning, you know, what has gone before doesn't mean you have to do exactly what they did, but you need a foundation because there's no official training for what we're doing. You know, there are things that you can learn that you can apply to it. 
You know, if you want to learn solid investigative techniques, either from, you know, a college course or, or whatever it is, you know, you can learn journalism, you can learn, uh, you know, research skills, a lot of these things you can take official courses for. Unfortunately, most of the people in our field don't do that. They don't take that approach. And, you know, they, they read a few things on the internet and they decide, Oh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a UFO expert. And, you know, they suddenly, uh, get a spot on a show or, you know, they make some appearance or something and, and suddenly they're a self-dubbed expert. And, you know, it leaves me kind of scratching my head wondering where's all those time and sweat this guy put in, you know, working in this field to understand these things, where he develop these ideas from, uh, you know, he's just repeating snippets off of Twitter or what. I'm probably rambling a little bit at this point, uh, but <laughs> it's been one of those days. The long and short day, you know, people need to get a solid foundation for their their understanding of the field they're interested in. Uh, they need to try to find a mentor, you know, whether it's someone that lives right next door down the street or, or in another state, whatever it is, someone they can communicate with, someone they can talk to and, and get consistent pointers from and if it's something that is uh, more like uh, paranormal investigation where it's group oriented then you know by all means they, they need to seek out a reputable team which is, is can be challenging uh, but a reputable team or group that they can uh, get some experience investigating with so that they can at least learn okay here's how this team is doing this and and you know get some get some comprehensive approaches to looking into some of these things, but you know, people really, I, I would love to see more people dig in more into, into research and a knowledge base and not just uh, listening to a few podcasts and getting a couple of ideas from here and there and, and thinking they've got it all down. David, one of the concerns that I brought up last night with our guest, we had Joni Mahan and Deanna Simpson on from the Hanover Haunting House and telling the story of the haunting when she lived in that home. And one of the things and one of the mistakes that she claimed she made was that she was new to the paranormal field, knew nothing of it, feels like her house is haunted, wants it investigated, goes on Google and finds the first few groups that are close to her a uh, house invites them in. They do their investigation. They absolutely stir things up and then take off like no one's business. And here she is uh, leaving with the aftermath of everything. My question to you is when it comes to people who may not know that they've got a ghost in their house or a poltergeist or, or they got Bigfoot or Dogman in their back forest or gnomes or sprites and they're trying to figure out what is going on. What is their best course of action in trying to find the right person? Because if you enter a field blindly, you're not going to know the difference between a David Weatherly and a Joe Sixpack who is a weekend warrior ghost hunter. Yeah, it's it's a it's a very tough thing. And when we're talking about something like a haunted location, you know, Every case is unique. Every situation is unique. And, uh, you know, this is, um, <clears throat> this is sadly too frequent that I hear things like this uh, about a, a situation. Someone's living in a home that, uh, that is, you know, they believe is haunted and they start experiencing a wide range of things. And, and they jump on an internet search and they, they get someone to come in who comes in, does an investigation and all they do is, is go back and, you know, write up their experience for their website to, because it looks cool and nothing else ever happens. You know, the client is just kind of left in the cold and, you know, this is, this is a tough thing. Now I, I tell people with situations like that, you know, you can't just let anyone in because if it is a, a negative haunting, it is going to stir things up and make the situation worse. Uh, again, it kind of goes back to what I was saying a few moments ago. You have to, you have to be, you have to be patient. You have to spend some time talking to some different people and getting some different opinions and, and finding someone that, uh, you know, all the signs say they're reputable. You know, we, we live in a 
time period where the, the attention span has gotten much lower. And even when people have uh, something that they need help with, a lot of times they're just not putting in a lot of effort to do the research. Now, sometimes that's because you know, they're afraid or, or they're concerned or whatever, and they want a quick answer. Uh, but this is, this is a, a very different world that you're entering into when you're dealing with a situation like this. So, you know, the, the answer is not going to come in 140 characters. You really have to, to check some things out and have to talk to some people. So again, it's about putting an effort in and finding some reputable people and getting some different opinions before you let someone in the house. And, you know, really, if it's someone with a, a, a haunting and they're having concerns about their safety or, or something like that, uh, I suggest if they're a religious person, I, I always suggest, you know, call in your, your priest or your pastor or your rabbi or, you know, whatever your tradition is and ask them to come in and do a blessing and uh, calm things down if, if they're people of faith. Uh, if they're not, it's kind of a different scenario. But, you know, this in and of itself will often at the least give the client a certain level of comfort so they can kind of get their breath and say, all right, you know, now I need to approach, uh, if there's still activity, now I need to approach, how do I have someone come and look at this? And really, you know, I always tell people, uh, it's best to check out the team's website. And if they've got a ton of cases on there that are, are all, you know, purportedly demonic activity, you probably should avoid them. Uh, you should probably have someone the first time come in who's who's more uh, balanced with their approach and is not making any you know, predisposed, predisposed judgments about what's in your home. We've got about 40 seconds left before we got to go to break at the bottom of the hour. David Weatherly is our guest tonight. And research is the key for absolutely everybody, it, it, isn't it? It's really about, you know, getting off your butt. Don't be lazy. Don't trust the first thing you see on Google. Take the time because the time can mean a lot in the research. Oh, yeah. They, do your research, build a knowledge base, and find a mentor. I mean, those those are three big keys, I, I believe. And, of course, you know, if you're going to be an active uh, investigator, you have to learn to get out in the field. You know, don't don't sit there at the computer. You need to learn how to get into the field and how to investigate, be it UFOs or cryptids or whatever it is. All right. David Weatherly is going to stick with us for the next couple of hours here on Spaced Out Radio. We're going to get into some winged humanoids in Chile next. Why not? If it's weird, if it's strange, if it's flying in the sky when it shouldn't be, if it exists when it shouldn't, David Weatherly is the guy to talk to about this. More with David Weatherly on Spaced Out Radio coming up. Hey, space travelers. This is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. 
we're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Hey, everybody. The SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great form for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. If you like it hot, real hot, then heat up your meals with Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get your Bumblefoot hot sauce today. The sauce, Bumblelicious, and the 4 million Scoville unit, Bumble. F- We're going in hot, real hot, coming out even hotter. Keep the milk nearby and tantalize your taste buds tonight. Bumblefoot hot sauce, available now at kajans.com. Cold drinks, great food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just $6.95. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes, it's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver, the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hello, Space Travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at YouTube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience is proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. So for more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. At spacedoutradio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Need that weekend supernatural fix? Look no further than Spaced Out Saturday right here at spacedoutradio.com. I'm Stacy Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Each Saturday night, Stacy and I are going to bring you the best in paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, you name it, and we're going there. It's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you. So tune us in every Saturday night on Spaced Out Saturdays starting at 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. We're taking Sunday nights out of this world on Spaced Out Radio. This is Michael W. Hall, also known as the Paranormal Lawyer. Together, we're going to go on an exciting journey into the unknown. I'm going to bring you some of the best interviews in the paranormal and supernatural to start your new week off on a freaky note. So tune in to Spaced Out Sundays with me, Michael W. Hall, only on SpacedOutRadio.com.
Welcome back to the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us. We really do appreciate it. We want to remind you, if you miss portions of this show or others, you can check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire, which is updated daily. Our Twitter handles for the show are at Spaced Out Radio, and my personal handle is at Dave Scott SOR. Make sure you give us a follow. Tonight we are talking with David Weatherly. He is one of the top researchers in North America, if not the world, when it comes to everything to do with monsters, UFOs, ghosts, you name it. He is on it. He's got a great website called EerieLights.com where you can find all of his books and other information that he has reported on. David, welcome back to tonight's show. Thanks, sir. You have a report that you've been looking into about humanoids with wings in the country of Chile. What is going on in South America, my friend? <laughs> you know, uh, Chile is a fascinating place. I, I've spent some time down there, and there was an article I posted recently on my website, and you can find that under the article section. Uh, it might still be on the front page, I can't remember, but it's actually a case <clears throat> from... Uh, from several years ago, and involved a security guard who was uh, patrolling this the outside of this building, and he had guard dogs with him. And as he's walking along the perimeter of this building, uh, this giant winged creature flew down at the dogs. Now these attack dogs were so terrified that they they ran away howling and the guard observed this uh humanoid uh, has it sort of it swooped down right at the dogs and then it turned and it flew and landed on this uh, metal pole that was near the building it's uh 30 feet in the air and he described this thing as being uh, around four feet tall with a small head uh pointed ears dark gray sort of leathery skin he said it didn't have any fur on it wasn't a bird and that it uh it appeared to have very long wings that extended from the shoulder area and then out now this thing perched on this metal pole for uh, a brief few moments and then it uh, took off off the pole with this weird screeching sound. He said it uh, sounded like the noise emitted by a loudspeaker when it's crackling. And of course he was, he was terrified at the incident and caused the, uh, caused the authorities right away. And they actually came and investigated the case. Now, you know, when the authorities showed up, uh, they, they couldn't find any evidence or anything, but the guard pointed out that, during this incident, he had seen a group of boys on uh, railroad tracks that run alongside of the building, and it was clear to him that they noticed the creature too. But they ran away <laughs> promptly when the when the thing was uh, flying around, and the authorities weren't able to locate the boys for further confirmation. So it's kind of an interesting case for a number of reasons. You know, there's uh, you've got someone who is in a position of uh, you know, where they're not going to hoax a, a sighting like this, that the guard didn't have any reason to do this. In fact, it was dangerous for him to do so to report it because, you know, he's in danger of losing his job reporting something like this. So it was really, to me, it seemed like there were no indications of it being a, a, a false report. And, you know, it's hard to... Uh, it's hard to reconcile exactly what this guy was seeing. If he was, unless he was way, way off about the size, uh, you know, when you think about the other things that he was saying, the, the leathery skin and the lack of feathers and everything, it rules out the only logical possibility, which would be a, an Andean condor. Uh, but 
you know, it's not just the physical description that rules them out. Uh, condors are, are uh, scavengers. So there'd be no reason for one of those to swoop down and attack a, you know, a guard, certainly not a pack of guard dogs like that. So it's a lot of aspects to the case that I found really kind of fascinating. And again, you know, there's some interesting cases that come out of Chile. I mean, there's Chupacabra reports down there, and uh, there's a, a number of these other winged humanoid reports that have come out of Chile over the years, uh, UFO reports, of course, and, and a wide range of other things. And, you know, in the United States, we don't hear a whole lot of these reports from South and Central America. Uh, I find them kind of fascinating because, um, you know, there's different genuineness about the people down there with a lot of them that I've met anyway. And, you know, you hear them tell these stories and uh, it, it kind of, I don't know. It gives you a little bit of a chill sometimes. <laughs> you know, can you imagine just calmly doing your job, walking some guard dogs one night, and a, a four foot humanoid comes swooping down at you? No, no, I, I, I'd be out of there. <laughs> I'd be out of there. It, it's real quick because you know the, the difference between you and me, Dave, is I'm a meal. Okay, so that's why I don't go in the ocean. That's why I don't, you know, go in near places with flying humanoids with, that look like they're right <laughs> out of the, the depths of hell. You know, I'm just not going there. Can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm being serious here for a second. You're laughing at me. But, I mean, the, the reality is true. I mean, this thing sounds like it is right out of the depths of hell. <laughs> So you're really disturbed by the wing things like this day? Kind of, yes. It's a little trippy, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, well, you know, there's a, I don't have all the details um, at the front of my mind at the moment. There, there's another, there's also a report I've got uh, somewhere about what someone believed was a winged chupacabra. Uh, from one of the South American countries. Now, I, I that's pretty disturbing. Yeah, so now we're talking about not just a, a humanoid, but something that is, you know, pretty uh, pretty vicious by a lot of accounts, flying around down there somewhere. That puts it in a whole different league. Dave, when you hear reports of something like this, and let's go back to the winged humanoid, my first inclination is to ask, well. What is it? Where does it come from? Because if I think of something like that, I think of evil movies. I think it has to be negative in some sort of way. If it's trying to attack a dog that's on a leash to to a man, that's dangerous to me. You know, where do these sort of things live? Are they in some remote cave on a hidden island or in the jungles? Or is it maybe a portal from a different time opening up? Could be. You know, it could... I suspect that there's not one singular answer to explain all of these things. And, you know, we dig into these cases uh, or, or, you know, researchers like myself do. And you always have to consider that a percentage of these cases, there's probably something um, that's been misinterpreted. Uh, you know, this, this one is not a, a good example because I don't think this gentleman was mistaken, but I've seen a few other, reports of, you know, quote, winged humanoids, and, you know, probably can be explained by some really large bird or something uh, from the natural world, just that, uh, that people aren't used to seeing, you know, uh, an out of place animal can be very shocking for someone, uh, you know, for instance, you know, m most of the, most places aren't used to seeing an Andean condor, uh, you know, so uh, seeing something like that creature would would be kind of shocking. And, you know, they have a 10 foot wingspan. Uh, they're, you know, they are, they have a body about four feet in size. Uh, so, you know, we're talking about a very, very large flying animal, but, you know, there are other distinctive things uh, about condors that if you're, you know, if someone is used to seeing them, then they're, they're probably want to say okay well that's that's what that is and then the males have a white collar of feathers uh, around the necks for instance so there's other aspects but you know you have to first approach the case and rule out okay let's look at it logically what could it have been and you know once once those things can be ruled out then it gets even more interesting now the question 
as to where these things come from, that's, yeah, that's, that's a real trip down the rabbit hole because uh, we could be talking about, um, you know, moments where people are seeing into another time. I, I honestly think that explains some of the Thunderbird sightings. You know, people are absolutely positive that they saw, a, a, you know, a, a flying dinosaur, you know, something from another age. And they'll go back and find artistic depictions of, you know, petrosaurs or something. And they'll say, that, yeah, I absolutely know that is what I saw. And we, you know, we really, as investigators, are, are kind of uh, less scratching our heads about that because you have to consider if there was a population of those things living, then the sightings would be more frequent. Yeah, this is a little bit different than Sasquatch, for instance. I mean, we're talking about something that uh, would be flying on a, a regular basis that would be seeking out prey, you know, and it's just not, uh, you know, they're, the sightings aren't, aren't that frequent, uh, yet there are just a, enough nagging few sightings that seem very credible that we're left wondering exactly what's going on here. Now, if something weird is happening with the matrix, so to speak, and people are somehow seen into another time, then that could explain some of these things. Um, other cases, much more difficult to say. You know, it, it's, it's one thing to glimpse something in the sky flying by, but it's another thing to experience something very uh, tangible that displays, you know, physical uh, a, a physical presence in a different way. So then we really have to wonder, all right, you know, exactly what's out there. And I, I always point out to people when it comes to cryptids, you know, there's, there's so much of this country that is, or, or of, the, of this planet that is unexplored. You know, so many dense forests and jungles and, and you know, there are vast tracts of, of desert and other pieces of land that just don't see human presence every day. So we really, we don't know everything that's out there. That's the reality. We're always discovering new species. Now, you know, most of the time each year it, it tends to be smaller species. Uh, but still, you know, every year new animal species are discovered. So the question becomes, you know, what's, what's out there? You know, what's in the depths of the ocean? What's in, you know, way back in the middle of, of you know, the forest or, you know, the Amazon jungle? Who, who knows? What about these pterodactyl sightings that people have reported seeing in Texas and Mexico? Does that kind of fall along the same lines? I know Jonathan Whitcomb yeah. has been researching those for years. I believe they're called the Ropin. Yeah. Yeah, I think it falls along the same lines. Interesting. He's, he's collected a lot of reports, but, you know, when you look at them, and I, I've, I've read his material, it's interesting. Uh, but again, you know, it falls into that same classification where there's, there's not so many sightings that we can say, okay, there's got to be a presence of these things here. Uh, yet at the same time, there's just enough nagging few that we have to wonder, all right, what exactly is, is you know, what exactly is going on? Audra kind of has an interesting question. Usually I don't take questions until hour number two, but she's asking, what about if they're interdimensional? I mean, we hear the interdimensional talk about Sasquatch. We hear it about Dogman. We hear it about fairies and gnomes and, and a lot of other creatures. Is that really in play or is that just our wannabe imagination? Well... Yeah, I, I mean, that's, again, that's a tough question, but, you know, I lean more towards some kind of opening or something happening where, where people are perhaps seen into a different era, you know, uh, time streams crossing, so, so to speak, rather than the creatures themselves being uh, somehow interdimensional or something. Now, you talk, and we're talking about the, these flying creatures, uh, because, you know, a lot of these sightings, uh, especially of the, the dinosaur-like creatures, when people spot them, these creatures seem to be just going about their normal behavior, so to speak, you know, just as you would picture them 
in their natural environment or their natural time period. Uh, whereas, if you're talking about something like uh, Sasquatch sightings, that's sort of a different world because there is a different level of uh, interactivity, if uh, you will, uh, between Bigfoot and humans to a certain degree. So, you know, a lot of those sightings, it becomes clear, for instance, that, well, this creature has seen the witness and, and has decided to avoid him or something. So, you know, again, I, I go back to the fact that I don't think there's any one explanation that is going to give us the answer for all these various cryptid encounters. I, I think there's just too much uh, variation and too many possibilities, you know, to, to look for a singular answer, which a lot of researchers want to do, I think is discarding a lot of material. And that's, that's not always a good thing. David, we got about five and a half minutes here before we have to go to break at the top of the hour. David Weatherly is our guest tonight. When it comes to these creatures then, Dave, you know, and this is kind of leading into what our thought of the Dave is today as we do it every day on this show. Out of all the cryptids out there, whether it's these winged humanoids, Bigfoot, Ropin, Dogman, whatever it may be, what do you think is the closest one we are closest to proving of existence? It's probably going to be some kind of unusual water creature, uh, simply because in terms of, you know, the, the vastness of the ocean, um, you know, in, in fact, I mean, over the last, what, 10 years or so, we have proven the existence of some of these things. You know, the giant squid was thought to be a myth and, uh, you know, that was proven real. So I think that, you know, we're constantly going to make new discoveries of various aquatic creatures. Now, I know everybody wants to hear me say Sasquatch, uh, but I think we still have some challenges to meet in terms of, you know, verifying the discovery of, of Sasquatch. And, um, you know, I, I suspect that it will happen, but I, I think it's just not, it's not yet in the immediate and, and, you know, maybe I'm wrong, maybe it happens, you know, this year <laughs> or something. I, I don't know. But, um, you know, if you ask me my opinion of what is most likely going to be discovered next, I, I think it's going to be another unusual water creature. See, I'm thinking it's either going to be something like a Megalodon type shark, or we're going to be able to learn that the thylacine is back and wasn't brought oh, to extinction. Now that would, that actually would have been my other answer because you know i there's some really good work being done and uh the the thylacine i find very very fascinating you know it's one of those that as uh we know it existed up until the 1930s you know because the last one died in captivity but there are so many convincing sightings and i i've I tried to make it to tasmania the last time i was in australia and didn't have a chance to and uh, i was actually uh, was scheduled to go back this year, and, and that didn't happen. But, um, yeah, I, I have high hopes for the thylacine being rediscovered, and, and I do believe that will happen within the next couple of years. That would be cool. That would be very cool. I think that would give Absolutely. You know, people a real boost and a shot in the arm that, you know, we can save a lot of these creatures, even if they are claimed to be extinct that there might still be ones hiding out somewhere. You know, and you think of the rhinoceros population in Africa that has been decimated by poachers. I mean, you just hope and pray. It gives hope. That's what it does. Yeah, it, it does. It does. I, I think the thylacine is very much a symbol of, of hope and, you know, survival. And, uh, you know, the, the tragedy of the story, for anybody who knows much about it, you know, how they were wiped out, it, it's just, it's, it's horrible. It's a the horrible mark of, you know, uh, human behavior, you know, how they were eradicated and to see them proven to still exist, it would just be phenomenal. I think. What about Megalodon or a bigger shark than a great white shark? I, I do think there's uh, you know, Megalodon is a big stretch because that thing is, is massive. Uh, but, I will say that I, I do think that there is a larger 
shark or at least a larger uh, predator type creature, uh, most likely some species of shark that's not yet discovered uh, because there's been some strange things over the last several years of, uh, you know, where was it? I think it was Australia again that a, a was it a great white head that washed up and something had bitten it off? And you know, there's been some weird things that have surfaced. And with how much climate change has been going on, you know, we're making uh, more discoveries quicker about the ocean. And of course, our technology is developing a lot quicker, too. So, you know, we're seeing some of these creatures that we knew existed that usually stay at the depths, uh, you know, greater depths of the ocean coming closer to the surface. And a lot of things are changing. Of course, you know, temperatures changing and everything else, that's going to have an effect. So uh, that's something else we're likely to see is the discovery. I was talking about a, an aquatic creature earlier. Uh, we're likely to see some kind of new predator discovered in the ocean. Yeah, that's going to uh, scare the, the daylights out of me. Why the Pacific? <laughs> Uh, is that because is that a shot at me because I'm on the Pacific, man? And you know this stuff scares me. Is that what it is, Dave? How do you feel about spiders, Dave? <laughs> so I'm okay with spiders. I'm okay you're with spiders. Okay with Snakes. Spi- you're sure you're okay with spiders? Yeah, I'm o- I'm okay with spiders. You know, if I see a spider in my house, I actually catch it and I put it back outside. You know, because you think of the bugs, man, that could be in your house if it wasn't for spiders. I like spiders. I, I got a good story, a good spider story uh, for you. But we'll come back to that one after the break because I know that's coming up. But, uh, yeah, the the Pacific, just because, you know, I've uh, – hearing some of the stories that I've heard from, from traveling down in the Pacific Islands, and there's a lot of traditions down there about a large uh, predator, you know, larger sharks. Uh, living in the ocean there. And I just, uh, I don't know, for some reason, I think that we're more likely to see it surface uh, in the Pacific than we are the Atlantic with, with how things are now. Well, we will soon see. And it will be one heck of a discovery. And once we start seeing this thing eating humans, you will be able to tell, <laughs> say you heard it here first, people. I told you to stay out of the ocean. I told you to stay out of the ocean. <laughs> Nothing good goes from going in the ocean. Wait until the, one of these things sinks an aircraft carrier or a submarine. It's going to happen. David Weatherly <laughs> is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. His website, eerielights.com. And I'll tell you, if you want one of the great books that he has written, go to this website. It is beautifully made. Go check out his Woodknock series on Bigfoot. We've got hour number two with David coming on up. And we're going to get into some gnomes because I love my gnomes. I am one with the gnomes. Next on Spaced Out Radio. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. 
Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! Hi, this is Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks, I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. Are you an experiencer of something strange that can't be explained? Do you want help finding out what's going on? I'm Ryan Stacy, head of the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESSA. We've teamed up with Spaced Out Radio to investigate cases filled out in the SOR Sightlines report. We are independent and there's no cost to what we do. All we need is your experience. Let's find out what's happening together on the SOR Sightlines report. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Hi there, this is the Paranormal Lawyer, Michael W. Hall. I'd like to invite you to listen in each Sunday night where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the Paranormal Lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. The party is always on at the Moose Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is where you want to be when visiting Canada's west coast. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose cranks up the rock while serving some of the best rated food in the city. The menu starts at $6.95. Why party anywhere else in Vancouver when the Moose is right there? Get your horns up and rock with the Moose, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hey everyone, I'm John Edwards. And I'm Stacey Edwards. Together we're taking over Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio where we're going to bring our own experiences of the paranormal and talk to the best people we can find to help bring you answers to your strange tales. We're here to entertain your need for weekend woo! So tune us in at spacedoutradio.com starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 AM Eastern where we can all get a little spooky together. Spaced Out Saturday nights right here at spacedoutradio.com. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do, what to do. Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning Bumblefoot. Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up? All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Our sales department is waiting to hear from you, and we can work around any budget. From commercial spots to banners to special promotions, there are many opportunities to get your name and product out to our SOR listeners. For a price guide and more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. 
Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. We want to welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates across North America and on the digital side on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. Remember, you can check out all of our archives for free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Nick Nakatori. Nick Nakatori is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire, and you got Bumblefoot to rock out to as well. On Twitter, follow us at Spaced Out Radio for the show, and my personal handle, at Dave Scott SOR. Every couple of months, we are proud to be joined by David Weatherly, who is one of the top researchers in North America, and if not the world, when it comes to everything mysterious and strange. His website is eerielights.com, where you can find all of his books, all of his work. He's got a great series on Bigfoot called Wood Knocks. You want to check that on out. David, thank you so much for joining us. And, you know, we're going to get into gnomes here, because you know I love the gnomes. I am one with the gnomes. But you want to share a scary <laughs> snake story of giant snakes, bigger than anacondas. Oh, I was going to give you a spider story that didn't seem to oh, uh, disturb you very much. But I, I, but maybe I'll give you that one. I, you know, there are a lot of stories and, and different legends of giant snakes uh, when you go well south of the border. And, you know, there's there's rumors of hundred foot long snakes in the Amazon. Now Mm -hmm. that seems a big stretch to a lot of people, you know, but, uh, you have to consider that anacondas, I think the largest anaconda they ever captured was, was pretty close to 30 feet long. Uh, I want to say it was 28, 29 feet. And, you know, something like that is going to weigh probably 500 pounds. Now, you know, that snake alone has got to be, plenty terrifying for you yes <laughs> 30 foot yeah. uh, 30 foot on anaconda no. and of course you know now now we're getting all these invasive anacondas in the everglades where they're thriving because there's so much yes. prey that's not used to to dealing with them uh but it, it's i got this really weird story years ago uh, i was i was traveling around and i was actually asking uh, i was actually trying to find more about some of these giant snake legends uh, because there's there's rumors of them being as, as big around as a Volkswagen and, you know, close to 100 feet long and all this kind of thing. But uh, in the course of this, I met this guy who was an American expat, and he told me a story. He said, well, you know, I don't, it was one of those things. This is a bar, of course. And, uh, you know, we sat there and had a couple of drinks, and, and he told me this story that uh, took place in 1996, so not too long ago, and this guy was spending his time seeking out uh, essentially lost lost cities, you know, lost, uh, lost locations in the jungles down there, and he was traveling uh, around the Argentina-Paraguay border. Now, 
He's driving in a Jeep, and he was on this old jungle back road. The Jeep had a, it was lifted up enough and made it easier to traverse the, and these are pretty rough roads. He's driving along, and he reaches over there to the passenger seat to, or something to grab his water bottle. And you know how these things can happen, you know, a quick glance over to grab that bottle, and he turns back, you know, lifting the bottle up and looking back out the front, you know, as he's driving. And he sees an animal in the road. He thought it was a dog. And he hits the brakes, but it's, it's so close that, you know, he, he's, he passes right over it. And, of course, he, he jumps out of the Jeep, and he runs back. And he's going at a pretty, you know, pretty decent clip, I guess. He, he runs back, and he's scanning the road, and he's looking, you know, in the road along the sides, thinking that he's hit this, this large animal and looking to see where it is. And he can't find anything. There's nothing there. So he he turns around and he looks in the other direction towards the Jeep and the Jeep's sitting there, you know, idling. And he bends down, Dave, and he looks under the Jeep. Oh, no. And when he does, he, of course, you know, looks initially he's looking at the ground to see if this animal is laying there. But then he's thinking, well, maybe I hit it and, you know, got caught in the Jeep or something. So he looks at the undercarriage. And he sees a spider. But this spider is dark brown. It's kind of furry like a tarantula. However, it's large enough so that its legs are reaching the sides of the Jeep on both sides. And he said this thing was clinging to the undercarriage and it was sort of undulating up and down. Like it was going to come off and come after him or something. And uh, he said that he couldn't, uh, all he could think was getting out of there. And he actually jumped back in the Jeep, slammed the door shut, and just floored it. And he's, he takes off. He's tearing down this jungle road, as you know, potholes and everything else, and, and bouncing all around. He keeps, you know, worrying that this thing's going to skitter around the Jeep or, or come out of something. But he sees in the rear view mirror, which he keeps looking, he sees this thing hit the road and sort of tumble and right itself so that it's upright, you know, watching the Jeep, and then it skitters off into the jungle. Hmm. So he continued at a fairly fast pace until he got back to the civilization. And, uh, you know, he, he didn't travel that road anymore. But he said he had heard other stories of these giant spiders that live deep in the jungle down there. And that was his, that was his experience. So there's probably a few See, people listening that uh, aren't very yeah. comfortable with spiders and undoubtedly are, are fairly creeped out at this point. No, you know what? That doesn't surprise me. Like my buddy, when he was serving in Afghanistan, he was telling me about these these camel spiders that they have down there that grow to about a oh, foot yeah. long, foot and a half long, and their yep. their legs get to like eighteen inches long, and they are just everywhere down there. And they burrow in the sand, and and that is just creepy, freaky, man, creepy, freaky when it comes to spiders. But you know, thank goodness I'm here where I am, man. I am here where I am. Don't have to worry about well, poisonous snakes. And then you got the the what's called the Goliath bird eater. Yes. Uh, which is a spider that feeds on birds. Yeah, that's not good. Uh, those those are those are pretty disturbing. <laughs> and I'm not I'm not I'm not really creeped out by spiders, but you know, when you're talking about one that is uh you know, like this guy, <laughs> oh that can cling to the underside of your Jeep, well, that's that's uh, kind of going into a different spectrum. All right, let's shift over to gnomes, man. Have you had any good <laughs> gnome stories lately here? Because I always get people, you know people, they're always asking me how the gnomes are. And by the way, this is how much I have transformed since your lecture to me on not being afraid of the gnomes. I now have five gnomes in the studio. Five. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. They'll bring you good luck. They are guarding it. They are guarding it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I, I love these, I love these stories. You know, I, I, I get the tidbits and stuff all the time. And, and of course I've been collecting accounts of, uh, the gnomes and the, the little people, you know, they're known by a lots of different names, um, uh, around the world. Uh, but I've been account, I've been collecting these accounts forever and, uh, they, they, always always fascinate me especially the modern ones you know because so many people think oh come on you know that's uh you know it's folklore it's mythology and and no it's uh there are still a lot of sightings occurring now this is one of those areas that you know a lot of people won't report these sightings because they think you know surely (laughs) i did not really just see you know a, a a little man, you know, a foot tall running, running across my property. Sure. Surely I didn't see that, but you know, I, I'm, I'm always happy when people are willing to share their accounts and, uh, the whole, the whole lore of this, you know, it, it's, it's something I've delved into quite a bit. You know, the term, the term gnome, I don't know if we've ever talked about this the term gnome actually comes from the Renaissance. Really? Uh, because it was, yeah, it was um, used initially to uh, refer to a spirit, and it was, um, oh, Pericles was the first one who utilized the term gnome. Uh, but it became used uh, extensively in during the Renaissance, and then, of course, afterwards, uh, during the Romantic period of writing, you know, it, it was incorporated in all the the various fairy lore uh, from different countries. However, you know, really these stories, uh, they're, they're pretty much as old as tribal cultures all over the world. And Native American uh, tribes in the United States, you know, have stories of little people going far back. And, of course, you know, the famous, the famous stories of, you know, like the elves in Iceland and the leprechauns in Ireland and, and all these different regional of variations that we have collectively, it all becomes pretty fascinating when you look at the lore as a whole and you start to think, okay, exactly. You know, there's, there's something more going on here. This is really probably where we get into another level of existence or another dimension as someone was kind of asking about earlier, you know, uh, because, so many of these tales, you know, they talk about this other race of these little beings that lived here before and that they left at some point, and whether it was because of a war with humanity or, or whatever the, the variation is. Uh, but they seem to have been a very real presence that just some, for some reason left, but doesn't mean they went extinct. And we come back around, you know, to modern sightings, that's, like I said, where it gets really fascinating. I mean, I've had law enforcement officers tell me about accounts, you know, seeing these things. And uh, I had an account fairly recently from a woman, oh, it was a couple months ago, I guess, who who said that she had had uh, a gnome who was coming into their house. You'll love this one. Coming into their house uh, through an open window. And uh, she... She lives in, in the West, in uh, um, the Rocky Mountains. And she said that this, that something was coming in the house that they first thought was an animal uh, because they would notice that things on this dresser would be kind of moved around. And she said that she walked in and just found herself uh, immobilized because of what she was seeing. And she said she was standing in, in the door of the room, looking across at the other side of the room at this dresser. And there stood a little man who was about a, a foot tall. And she, I mean, she described him to a T. She said he was wearing, you know, what she described as, as uh, old fashioned clothing. And, uh, you know, that it looked, she said that she, it looked like he had tweed pants on is what she said and a, uh, a shirt and a little hat. It wasn't a pointed hat. It was just a, a little hat that kind of stood up a, a little bit. And 
she said that he had her husband's pipe in his hand. That he put the pipe down and jumped out the window. She said she she could she thought about going over to look out the window and she said she just stood there for what she felt was like was the longest time trying to process what she had seen. Now, curiously, the she later had a conversation with her husband because she didn't tell him about it initially. She waited a while. And she said that her husband finally said one day, uh, about a week later, I wish you would stop messing with my pipe. Said this to his wife. And she, she's, you know, she never touches his pipe. And she says, I, I never touch your pipe. And uh, she says, well, you know, maybe you're doing it when you're cleaning or something. He you know, was just kind of cantankerous about it. And uh, they get into this whole discussion about it. And she later finally told him what she had seen. And he just kind of, you know, wasn't sure what to make of it. I, I guess uh, wasn't one with the gnomes, so to speak. But she said that she later saw this little figure uh, another time in her back garden. So of course, perfect place for she it. She has the gnomes, right? She has the gnomes uh, walking amongst her flowers and uh, visiting her home through the window. At least one of them. That is really cool. That is really cool. And and you know they have such a. a, a an ego, if you talk it to First Nations or Native Americans about them, where if you treat them wrong, they're going to strike back at you one way or another. Why are these things so known for their their revenge tactics, if we could use that term? Yeah, so a lot of times in the tales, they have sort of a trickster-like persona. And some of that goes back to traditional stories about uh, how mistreated they were by humans when humans first came along. So, you know, there's this implication that uh, early contact, so to speak, between uh, humans and and these uh, other races of these little people didn't go so well. We find that reflected in a lot of the the various Native American tales, you know, that they were um, left alone to a certain degree. And, and sometimes, you know, something happened that there was, a, a, you know, the humans or the tribe or, or whatever went after them. And it led to nothing but lots of trouble because, um, as you stated, they can be, um, they, they very much can, make you pay from mistreating them, so to speak. So, you know, we have this uh, trickster-like component where you have to be careful about it, but if you behave properly and and you're courteous to them, then you're more likely to get good fortune as a result of it. Uh, But, you know, if if you're making trouble, and sometimes it's something as innocent as, you know, uh, rearranging a garden or, you know, cutting a tree down, you shouldn't have cut down, things like that. Uh, it can lead to lots and lots of problems. Uh, you don't see it much in North America, but when you go to parts of Europe, you'll see areas that are very conscious of the fact that certain places are considered uh, property of, of the Fae and they're left alone. You know, sometimes it's a tree that is right there where they want to build a road, but the locals say, nope, you're not taking that tree down. You know, it, it, <laughs> that's a fairy tree, and uh, you better build your road around it. So that happens sometimes. And it's it's an old custom, and some people think it's just superstition, but again, there's so many different things that recur throughout history of incidents where misfortune befalls people who who mistreat these little people. So, you know, you can take the the whole thing a lot of different ways. You can take it literal and say, okay, you know, there literally are uh, these little 
you know, these small human beings that are living on some level of existence, uh, or it, it could be, you know, some kind of a, a different dynamic at play that's within the human consciousness or something. We don't really have the answers to it, uh, but, you know, maybe there's, there's something else to this. I, I tend to think that there's a different level of reality to the stories, quite honestly, because, you know, it just goes through all through human history. And some of these things I find that, you know, go far back in, in, into early cultures, um, like the old adage, you know, when there's smoke, there's fire. So I think there is something to a lot of these stories. Uh, I think a lot of the components of them, we just don't understand, you know, we don't understand exactly how they exist or what level they exist on. Maybe we'll figure it out, you know, through quantum physics or something. I'm going to ask you, as we got about two minutes left, if somebody suspects that they have little people or gnomes around, is it proper to set out a gifting site for them in order to appease them so that way you don't get in any trouble where your jewelry goes missing or your favorite pair of socks or underwear go missing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there are things they like. You know, uh, often uh, some of the most common things are... uh, milk, honey, uh, things like that. Uh, Sometimes uh, shiny things will attract them. Uh, You know, just little things that you can gift to them uh, that they will appreciate. You you also have to be careful that, you know, if if you're noticing some activity or you think there's some kind of activity or a presence around a particular area, don't disturb that area. You know, if there's a tree there or plants there or something, don't, don't mow them down or cut anything down because that very well may be, you know, their domain. And again, if you're, if you're kind to them and you put things out for them, then yeah, you're going to get a benefit from it. Greco wants to know with 30 seconds or less, are the Smurfs gnomes? (laughs) Well, the, the Smurfs are a modern in, interpretation of little people so you know i mean a, a cartoon version of um, of little people legends to some degree well there you go there you go we're going to get into some more monster talk when we come back because you got a great book about to come out soon called monsters at the crossroads and i gotta tell you there's one monster in there man that I, i'm not going in any lakes in indiana i could tell you that I am not going in any lakes or waterways. But then again, the only reason why I would have to go to Indiana is to pay homage to the one and only W. Axel Rose of Guns N' Roses. That's it. That's where he's from. But I want to find out about this gigantic turtle that will snap you in half. David Weatherly on Spaced Out Radio, eerielights.com. Coming up on Spaced Out Radio next. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. Cold drinks, great food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just $6.95. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes, it's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver, the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. At SpacedOutRadio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. 
Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. If you like it hot, real hot, then heat up your meals with Bumblefoot Hot Sauce. Get your Bumblefoot Hot Sauce today. The sauce, Bumblelicious, and the 4 million Scoville unit, Bumble. We're going in hot, real hot, coming out even hotter. Keep the milk nearby. And tantalize your taste buds tonight. Bumblefoot Hot Sauce, available now at kajons.com. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Need that weekend supernatural fix? Look no further than Spaced Out Saturday right here at spacedoutradio.com. I'm Stacy Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Each Saturday night, Stacy and I are going to bring you the best in paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, you name it, and we're going there. It's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you. So tune us in every Saturday night on Spaced Out Saturdays starting at 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and bombs are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. We're taking Sunday nights out of this world on Spaced Out Radio. This is Michael W. Hall, also known as the Paranormal Lawyer. Together, we're going to go on an exciting journey into the unknown. I'm going to bring you some of the best interviews in the paranormal and supernatural to start your new week off on a freaky note. So tune in to Spaced Out Sundays with me, Michael W. Hall, only on SpacedOutRadio.com. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience is proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. For more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. 
Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for joining us. Really do appreciate you taking the time. I want to remind all of you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Don't forget, you can give our Twitter handle a follow as well, at Spaced Out Radio for the show, as well with myself. You can find me at Dave Scott SOR. David Weatherly is here tonight on Spaced Out Radio. He joins us every couple of months to hang out and talk all things monsters and cryptids. His website, eerielights.com, where you can find all of his books. And he's got a ton of them out there. And they're all fantastic, beautiful covers, you know, by artist uh, Sam Sheeran. David, welcome back to the show. Always a pleasure to have you here, man. Always a good time. You got a new book coming on out here very soon called Monsters at the Crossroads, Cryptids and Legends of Indiana. Now, on the cover of this thing, man, you've got literally the biggest tortoise or turtle I have ever seen. And this thing looks like it could rip a person in half. It is like freshwater jaws, man. Freshwater jaws. (laughs) That's... uh... Oh, excuse me there. That is Oscar, the Beast of Busco. What's his story? What's Oscar's story to fame? So, and this creature, you know, this series I've been doing, Dave, um, started off with uh, a book on Nevada, and I moved along just because I've been digging into, I've got years and years of files and realizing how many cryptid sightings and everything else. And I did the Nevada book because no one had really delved into that. I ended up doing uh, several others. This is Indiana. The Indiana book will be the fourth one in the series now. Uh, And there's, I can tell you, there's already a couple of more coming out right behind this one. Uh, But Monsters at the Crossroads will be out probably uh, late spring. And as you're, as you've noted, the cover is a giant turtle. Now, I throw this stuff at Sam, and, and usually what I do is select the theme, and, and I've been taking some of the – trying to take the state's notable cryptid other than Bigfoot to put on the cover and, and feature something different and give some attention to some of these uh, other legends that each state has. In Indiana, there's this whole unique story about this giant turtle. And it actually starts in 1898 when a farmer uh, spotted a giant turtle living in this little lake that was on his property. Now, the farmer's name was uh, Oscar Folk. So Folk, uh, he spotted the creature told a lot of his neighbors about it, told the townsfolk about it and everything, but he just left it alone. He thought, oh, you know, this turtle's not bothering me. I'm not going to bother it. However, quite a few years later, in the 1940s, uh, the property was purchased by a gentleman named Gail Harris. And when Harris inherited when he, when he purchased the property, he was a farmer also, and uh, he proceeded to uh, put his crops down and work the land. And in, in the summer one year in the late 40s, 
his uh, Harrison's brother-in-law was out on this lake with a friend of his, and the guys were fishing. And during their their time out on the water, they spotted a giant turtle. Now, this is quite a few years later. You know, we went from 1898 up to 1948, uh, I believe it was when the, when these guys sighted it. So they claim that this giant turtle was moving through the water like a submarine, and, and they estimated that it was probably about 500 pounds or more. Oh, goodness. The guys rushed out. They went and told uh, went and told Gail Harris, you know, and, and uh, the family, and said, oh, you've got a giant turtle living in your lake, you know. And, and Harris initially just thought, well, you know, he, he wasn't sure whether to believe the story or not because his brother-in-law had a, a little bit of a propensity to come up with wild stories and, and pranks, so he just blew it off. However, that fall, Harris himself, along with a local minister, were on the roof of his uh, barn doing some work, uh, repair, doing some repair work. And as these two gentlemen are working, they notice something very large swimming in the lake. So they watch this thing, kind of interested, but, uh, you know, they didn't get down or, or stop their work or anything. But how... However, the next morning, uh, Harris decided that he was going to take a closer look. So he goes down to the lakeside, and he's looking around. And what does he see but a, a giant turtle? Now, he said that the head of this turtle was the size of a baby. And that the shell was probably around six feet long or more. So we're talking about a very sizable animal. Now, this is where the story starts to get kind of strange in a different way, because for some reason, Harris became obsessed with capturing this turtle. He initially called the thing Mr. Turtle, and he began to plot different ways and, and try different things to catch the turtle. He tried nets. He tried traps. He tried all these different things. The story started to spread. People started coming from all over the place to catch a glimpse of this giant turtle. Uh <laughs> By the end of the 40s, there were all kinds of rumors and stories floating around. Supposedly, the Cincinnati Zoo had offered to, to purchase the turtle if Harris could capture it. They said they would pay or something like uh, almost $2,000, like $1,800 or something. Now, you know, 1948, 49, that's, that's a big chunk of change, yeah. especially for a, a rural farmer. So... Harris continues to try all these different schemes to capture this turtle. And Dave, it gets bizarre because he, he hires renowned turtle uh, catchers. You know, <laughs> he, he tries, he tries all these different things. He has these guys come in that guarantee they'll catch it, catch it. Uh, they've got a secret trap that they've built. He gives them time, but they, they aren't able to catch it. And along the way, the creature is getting so much media coverage. Uh, the community dubs him Oscar in tribute to the original owner of the land, Oscar Folk. So uh, Oscar the giant turtle captures all this media attention that spreads even overseas. At one point, they estimated that over 5,000 people were on the farm, on the Harris farm, trying to get a look at the lake and this giant turtle. Now, this is, this is farmland. This is muddy, rural Indiana farmland. The crops are being, the crops are being trampled. The, the land is being, you know, uh, trampled by, you know, human traffic and vehicles that are parked everywhere. There's traffic backups 
that the police have to come in and try to manage. There's all these things. And it gets weirder and weirder. Harris hires a diver to try to go down <laughs> to, to find the turtle and to capture him. And, and that turns into a whole fiasco because they don't have, uh, you know, the, the diving suit doesn't show up all in, in one piece. And, you know, this happens and that happens. And he just continues to spend money and, and to try to catch this turtle. Other stories crop in, you know, a neighbor claims that a giant turtle came out of the lake and ate one of his cows. Uh, you know, there's, there's people talking uh, about all these different things about the, the, you know, the giant turtle. The electric company says that they will help Harris, and uh, he hatches a scheme to try to shock the water with electricity to force the turtle to come out. Doesn't work. The traps don't work. The diver doesn't work. All these things, one after another after another. Hunt, turtle hunters from everywhere. None of them can catch Oscar. Finally, the last plan that Harris hatches is that he's going to drain the lake. He builds this contraption. He now this, and I should say this is after the lake is shot. They send you know like twenty five hundred volts of electricity into the water. They shock all these you know fish and and other wildlife and everything else that comes you know flying up to the surface, but no turtle. So then you know Harris hatches this scheme. He's going to drain the lake. So he rigs up this this uh he gets a pump he rigs up this contraption to power it with his tractor because he's not doing any farming anyway and he constructs all this piping and he starts pumping this lake dry he <laughs> he pumps out you know all this water at one point the line busts and, and a lot of the water ends up going back in uh, he, he, he hooks it up again. He pumps this thing for weeks and he gets the, the water so low, but the turtle still doesn't surface. Now, bear in mind, there's been a bunch of people that have seen this turtle. So, you know, at some point there certainly was a turtle there, but a tur- turtle never surfaces. And he gets it down, he gets the lake down fairly low and then realizes that if the turtle is still in there, then it has probably buried itself in the mud at the bottom of the lake. So again, it seems that Oscar has outsmarted the farmer. Finally, okay. finally, uh, you know, Harris, uh, he had a, I think it was a, if I remember correctly, an appendectomy. So he had to go to the hospital, and you know, so he's he's out for uh, you know part of a month or whatever. He comes back by now it's December, and he goes out. the The lake has started to refill from rain, you know, because of the season, rain and snow and, and ice melt. Uh, the lake is, is frozen over. Harris goes out. And he's punching holes in the ice trying to catch the turtle. So this this weird obsession that occurred, you know, connected to this turtle is a lot of the story. And it's just kind of when, when you read that, I'm giving you just a brief synopsis, you know, but uh, the countless schemes this guy has trying to catch this turtle, it just... It, it reads almost like a bizarre comedy or something. And, uh, you know, no one could really explain what it, you know, why he became so obsessed with it. Now, the thing is, is that the turtle, he stayed and he made news. He made headlines, uh, for quite some time. I mean, he had a good stretch of, Oh, you know, probably two years there where there was constant updates and, and stories about Oscar, the beast of Busco. And, the uh, sort of the end of the story is that 
in the summer of 1950, August 1950, uh, Gail Harris, the farmer, was back in the news again. But this time it was for a very different reason. The farm was headed to the auction block. He had spent all of his money. He was deep in debt. And he wasn't, you know, he hadn't done any farming during all that time, uh, partially because of, you know, the obsession that was driving him to catch this turtle and partially because so many people had come to the farm to, to try to see this cryptid that, you know, he had he had no choice but to sell the farm and, and uh the, the farm was auctioned off, rather, and uh, he packed his family up and moved to, to Fort Wayne and took a, took a job, ironically, with General Electric, the company that had offered to help him shock the lake to catch the turtle. So, you know, that's where he lived his days out doing that. It's funny because one of the, one of the papers interviewed him, uh, you know, in the aftermath of all this after he had you know, moved away and, and was working for General Electric. And he even said, he said, uh, I'm going to try to catch that turtle someday. I know it's, I know it's still there. But that was it. The, you know, the people who bought the property, uh, they didn't have, they didn't want any <laughs> cryptid tourism, so to speak. And they basically said, if the turtle's there, we're leaving him alone. He can live in his days in peace in that way. Uh, we're not going to bother him. So, when's the last time that we know this like, turtle was sighted? Uh, well, you know there were there were stories. Um, uh, there were sightings during the period that Harris was trying to capture him, and uh, quite a few people who claim that they saw Oscar himself. Uh, but really, the last account that's kind of related to that comes in around 1950, uh, when a couple of guys were, were doing work in the area, and uh, they spotted a giant turtle elsewhere in the area. And uh, it was trying to, uh, they were trying to drain some swampland and convert it into farmland. Uh, now these guys, one of them was like a city planner, the Miami county Dolphins planner, the and the other one was a surveyor or something. And they saw a With giant the turtle. They had built this culvert to uh, try to drain the, the water. And they they actually Jordan saw a Love, giant turtle get stuck in this State. thing, and they okay, tried to they tried to help this Aaron turtle Rogers get through. The they said the head on this turtle wouldn't Brett fit through Favre the drain, which is about 30 inches inside. They so, again, we're talking about a massive animal. Round, and uh, they Brett said it was bigger Favre, than a beer barrel. And you have to wonder uh, they they how tried to get this, this turtle be, out. And that a quarterback they thought it was some kind of a snapping turtle, overall, possibly. When Aaron Rogers uh, but went it, it got away and went along its very way, too. And that was, but there oh, you have the fourth like I said, around 1950 or something. There's a few scattered reports from... You see there, five, six, um, you know, 52, 54 school, in that region. But the legend lives on because and he in the aftermath the of all of that, the town ended Utah up State. Let's go back having to a Turtle Day celebration, which Kurt is still Day, held every year to this person? year. And, and it's, it's basically done as a community event. You know, it's a fundraiser well, yeah, for a uh, various bit, things, you know, like the Boy Scouts and the fire department and things like that. Years, but it's really fascinating to, to see, you know, here is this unique story that has had but a lasting effect on a town. And the town has really embraced it, so to speak. You know, I've got somebody gave me that the fire department has one of their hats. The fire department has the a turtle throws with a fire hat and holding a big a axe ready to and so bust in and, and save somebody. So, uh, Turbusco is the town, and it's known, know its nickname is Turtle Town, USA. Uh, so, even to this day, there's still a celebration of Oscar the Beast of Busco. 
Very intriguing indeed. David, we have a, a couple of minutes left here before we got to go to break at the top of the hour. David Weatherly is our guest. You know, it's amazing how many towns have these cryptid stories, but very few actually take advantage of the the popularity of this field because of embarrassment or they don't want that brought, that idealism brought on their community. It's amazing how that works, man. It is amazing. It's just, sometimes it's really sad, you know, because there's some just some incredible stories out there and you think, wow, this, this community could really use this. You know, the, the folks in Indiana there that have uh, created this celebration, I mean, they do it as, as a fundraiser and it's good for the community. You know, it's a small town still. Uh, you know, if anybody has a question about such things at seating, man, all they got to do is look at Point Pleasant because the Mothman Festival, uh, it, it's, it's phenomenal. I, I was there, I think the year before last and they had like 10,000 people there that weekend. I mean, Point Pleasant is a tiny little town, but they really have embraced this legend and, it's good for the whole community. You know, it really is because the rest of the year, there's not much happening in Point Pleasant. But, you know, I know for a fact that some of those businesses there, they make their whole bankroll that weekend of the Mothman Festival just because it's such a draw. So I, I love it when they when these towns embrace this stuff. I, I wish more of them would. Yeah, it'd be nice. I mean, I even look at my own community. I mean, you've been up here. It's very haunted. There's the Miriam Delicato uh, UFO abduction, alien abduction from 1988. And there's a lot of mm-hmm. things going on up here. But, you know, people in my town, for the most part, because it's a an older class uh, population town, I could say it. they don't want to to have that around. They they think it's going to make people laugh at the community, man, as we got about a minute left. Yeah, and that's just, I, I mean, that's a certain amount of narrow-mindedness and, you know, just sort of uh, old, old-fashioned thinking, I guess. But, you know, embrace it, have fun with it. You know, there's there's lots of ways it can be approached, and it can either be done really seriously or you can do it to a different degree. I mean, the the Churubusco celebration is it's kind of an offhand thing. You know, yeah, it's themed around the turtle and the cryptid, but, you know, it's, it's not really what the whole festival is about. Mothman is kind of the polar opposite because you got speakers, you got the whole theme, and it's really embraced it. So I think there are a lot of degrees to which it can be done. Well, you know what? More communities should jump on board. And, you know, it's amazing how backwards a lot of these, you know, local politicians are because it's free money. It's free money yeah. when you look at it. Oh, yeah. You know, tourism Great money tourism. Is, the, is the cheapest money you can make and the easiest if you just have an idea. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Create that draw, you know, because people will travel for this stuff. They want to experience these things and they want to hear the legends. So, you know, and these, these stories, they shouldn't be lost. They should be uh, documented and and saved and people should, uh, you know, honor them to whatever degree. David, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the top of the hour here. David Weatherly is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio, and we're going to continue on with some monster talk to start off hour three. We got him for another 30 minutes, and then we got the SOR Newswire and the Thought of the Dave. A busy, jam-packed hour number three coming up on Spaced Out Radio next. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. The party is always on at the Moose Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is where you want to be when visiting Canada's west coast. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose cranks up the rock while serving some of the best rated food in the city. 
The menu starts at $6.95. Why party anywhere else in Vancouver when the moose is right there? Get your horns up and rock with the moose, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! Hello, everyone. This is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We're glad to team up with Spaced Out Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightlines Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines Report on the Spaced Out Radio website, and let's figure out what's going on together. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up. All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Hey everyone, I'm John Edwards. And I'm Stacy Edwards. Together we're taking over Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio where we're going to bring our own experiences of the paranormal and talk to the best people we can find to help bring you answers to your strange tales. We're here to entertain your need for weekend. Woo! So tune us in at spacedoutradio.com starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern where we can all get a little spooky together. Spaced Out Saturday nights right here at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is the paranormal lawyer, Michael W. Hall. I'd like to invite you to listen in each Sunday night where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news. 
along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do, what to do. Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauce has come in three flavors. The burning bumble f***. Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajons.com. Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Our sales department is waiting to hear from you, and we can work around any budget. From commercial spots to banners to special promotions, there are many opportunities to get your name and product out to our SOR listeners. For a price guide and more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate you taking your time out of your evening to spend with us. We say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates across the continent and on the digital side on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. Remember, you can check out all of our archives for free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Nick Nakatori. Nick Nakatori is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire, which is updated daily. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio for the show and my personal handle at Dave Scott SOR. For the final time tonight, we introduce David Weatherly. He is one of the top researchers in the field of everything from monsters to UFOs and every ghost spooking place in between. His website, eerielights.com, you can find all of his books there. I mean, he is so talented. We're glad to have him on every couple of months to talk about the strange and weird with all of you. David, welcome back to the show. Thanks, man. No problem. Hey, man, I want to ask you uh, a question here from Mark in the chat room. He's wondering what your thoughts are on Skinwalker Ranch. Oh, that's that's probably a whole show in and of itself. <laughs> it's, um, it's a fascinating place. Uh, you know, I always say that although a lot of the focus is on the ranch itself because of uh, primarily the book and uh, – Robert Bigelow, who sent the NIDS team in and did a lot of research. Uh, it is a place of, of just a crazy amount of anomalous activity. However, that area that the ranch is located in is, is called the Uinta Basin, and I have tracked strange occurrences in that whole region. So uh, I think it's not just the ranch itself, uh, but the, the Uinta Basin in general that has a high degree of strange activity. And, uh, you know, it, it's getting a whole new round of attention now because the television series has started based on, on Skinwalker Ranch and the new owners are much more open to, to having something like that occur. So I guess we'll see what happens with that, but man, it's, it's a crazy place. Uh, you know, UFO sightings, uh, cryptids, just a whole wide range. It, it certainly is a point of high strangeness. With the television show that's out there right now, do you believe that we're actually going to get 
any sort of answers of the high strangeness that's going on there from Brandon Fugel and his team? Well, <laughs> you know, that's uh, that's a tough thing. I, I think continuing to do research on the ranch itself is a great idea. And, you know, I would suspect that more questions than answers are going to arise. Uh, I'm, and this is not even addressing the television show. I think you have to look at it as a separate thing. You know, there's, there's the entertainment aspect depicting uh, this research that's going on there, but what's going to be more fascinating to track is the, the genuine research that is going on on the ranch, you know, to see what happens. But, you know, people just love the whole concept. I, I'll be honest, I haven't seen any episodes of the show, so I don't know, you know, exactly what they've they've shown so far. I know that it's similar in format to the Oak Island show, and uh, that's been tremendously successful. You know, they've squeezed six or seven seasons out of two guys digging a hole. So, you know, the mystery is what's compelling. And if something is genuinely discovered, then it's going to be pretty fascinating. All right, let's switch gears here because we did want to get into werewolves as well with you tonight. Now, for a lot of people, this is a question that comes up during this show a lot when we talk about dogmen. There is this misconception that a dogman is actually a werewolf. Do you see them as two totally separate creatures or one of the same? Uh, well, <laughs> that's that's a tough question because, honestly, we don't really know what a dogman is. Uh, you know, when you get down to the bear tactics, uh, I guess you could look at a literal interpretation, say uh, a werewolf is a creature that has, you know, uh, shifted from human form into wolf or, you know, wolf-like form. So by those standards, we would say that these may be two different things because a lot of researchers seem convinced that dogmen are a separate entity, you know, a separate creature, some kind of thing that stays in this bipedal canid form all the time. And, uh, the accounts, of course, are fascinating. I, I'm very interested in old werewolf lore, and I think it's fascinating to look at the, the similarities between, you know, all these early werewolf stories and then accounts of dogmen. And, and I'll be honest with you, you know, it, it's one of those things that my colleagues and I have talked about this, uh, you know, some of the other guys have really dealt into the crypto stuff and, you know, we all kind of agree that this is something that it's hard to really put your finger on what's going on here. I, I mean, there's there's probably some of these sightings that are uh, actually Sasquatch encounters or sightings, uh, but then you get other accounts where the person is saying that they very distinctly witnessed a canid-like head, you know, with a long snout and pointy ears, and man, again, it's one of those things we're left scratching our heads wondering exactly what the heck is going on here. But all that being said now, you know, there's a lot of werewolf lore that came to this country with early European settlement. Uh, so, you know, North America had a huge influx of uh, French, German, you know, other Europeans who had very rich traditions of werewolves and they brought those beliefs with them. So, how that translated and, and melded into these current concepts of dogmen, that's, that's kind of a question that's interesting to look at. Do you think there are actual werewolves walking around that are humans by day and then come that full moon that they are transforming into a werewolf? You know... In terms of uh, a werewolf, you know, like from the movies, you know, like from American Werewolf in London or something, uh, probably not. Uh, however, you know, the the realm of possibilities is wide open. And some of these sightings is kind of like the, the Thunderbird sightings we were talking about earlier in the show. You know, some of these sightings are so intriguing. Uh, there's there's not a massive number 
of them, but at the same time, we have some of these accounts that are just so uh, in, intriguing and and strong enough that we know there's some kind of mystery there that hasn't been solved, and it's just you know it's damned puzzling. Uh, the the Defiance werewolf, uh, Defiance Ohio werewolf sightings in the seventies. That's a good example. You know, a lot of people saw this thing, and they were describing what looked like a werewolf straight out of a, you know, universal horror movie. You know, they're seeing this bipedal wolf-like creature wearing the remnants of clothing, you know, these rags, and it's uh, roaming through this community. And and numerous people encountered this thing, uh, railroad workers, housewives, and all these people, and uh, are, are very consistent with what they were describing and what they were seeing. So, that's one of those things that we have to wonder, you know, what, what happened in that town during that period, what exactly was going on. Uh, so I, I don't know, man, it's, uh, it, it's one of the things in this field that it's both interesting and frustrating at the same time, because we have all these questions and it seems we have few answers because we either have to leap to a conclusion that may or may not be wrong, or we have to really leave it wide open and say, well, okay, maybe. When it comes to the, a lot of these stories, whether it's werewolves, whether it's the, the, the grass man, whether it's the frogmen of Ohio, I mean, a lot of these sightings just happen to be like a couple of fleet instances by good, honest people who are not wanting that type of publicity, but they report the sighting, and then these creatures just seem to vanish into thin air. What do you think is with that? I mean, do you believe it is, David, that we have entered some sort of of portal or other time d- dimension or something along those lines that we can't uh, uh, under, uh, really understand or explain? Or do you think that, that just maybe that these creatures are out there, but they're just as scared of humans as, you know, many animals are out there when they see people around? Well, again, I think it's some of both, you know, because I, we, we have so many Sasquatch sightings, you know, from, from diverse areas that, you know, there is, there is most certainly something, I, I believe there's most certainly something out there in the wild that fits the, the description of a Bigfoot uh, that has continued to survive and live, you know, in remote areas. So I think that's one that we can pretty much say, okay, this, this thing is out there. Uh, other accounts much more difficult to understand exactly what's going on. You know, did these people themselves have some weird experience where they step through to another reality or did they see into another time or, or did something, you know, so affect their consciousness that they believe they experience these things? Because as you pointed out, you know, some of these accounts come from, people with very solid reputations and backgrounds and they have absolutely no reason to, to make these things up and, and, you know, certainly no benefit. And a lot of times it's to their detriment that they reported these things, but they stand by their stories and they're adamant about what they experienced, even though they can't explain it and no one can explain it for them. So, those are the ones that, you know, leave us with a big question mark and force us really to look at a wide range of possibilities and potentials, because in, in many cases, we just don't have, uh, traditionally the, the living cultural traditions that help us embrace or comprehend some of these more unusual things. Now, it's different for a lot of uh, Native peoples. You know, for Native traditions, uh, very often there are answers. You know, and they'll say, okay, well, that's, oh, yes, the, the little people, we've always known about them. They're, they're there if you leave them alone. You know, uh, if you treat them right, they'll treat you right. Um, you know, we go to the Southwest, we've got the Navajo tradition of skinwalkers. Now, there's, there's a shapeshifter. And, you know, I, I've done extensive work delving into the the legends of the skinwalkers and you know these things are um 
in many terms, what sounds like a, a traditional uh, werewolf, you know, from the movies. It's it's a a human that has found a way to transform into an animal or partial animal form. And one of the big differences is is that the Navajo culture has a way to comprehend this, to understand this. It, it is part of their worldview that people who practice these particular traditions that are considered dark magic, evil magic, then they gain the ability to uh, shift their form somehow. And, you know, there are sightings of this all throughout uh, history in the Southwest, uh, these creatures. So we have to, I think, start looking outside of the box in a lot of ways. Uh, especially when it comes to these sort of one-off encounters or these small sets of encounters that crop up and try to understand exactly what's happening. Uh, I know I mentioned quantum physics earlier, and I think that ultimately uh, we may get some answers out of some of these quantum scientists that are, are starting to look at the essentially the strangeness of the universe and how things operate, you know, because these guys are talking about you know, parallel dimensions and alternate worlds and all kinds of ideas that only 20 years ago were pure science fiction, but that are now being considered as valid potentials and and possibilities. And some of these things may in turn give us answers to some of the more uh, bizarre and paranormal mysteries that we've been pondering for so long. With werewolves, do you believe that many people are just coincidentally maybe seeing a bear on two legs standing up, and that's maybe what they're claiming as a werewolf? Because, I mean, we've seen bears with mange or or very thin, aggressive bears that are walking on two legs, and, and it looks freaky to people, especially if you don't see it in the light of day or see it in the distance. Sure. Yeah, and that's that's the argument sometimes. You know, I, I've heard that argument on numerous occasions for um, these dogman sightings. I've heard it for Sasquatch sightings, too. And uh, I, I've seen a bear stand on its hind legs and move about. It is an odd sight. You know, if you've never seen a bear and, you know, if you consider the conditions the person is having the experience, you know, is, is it is it fleeting as they're driving by or is it, that night or, you know, what are the circumstances then? Yes, yeah, certainly. I, I think there's a percentage of those that can be explained away uh, by something in the natural world. On the other hand, there are just as many of these things that uh, those explanations just don't fly. And, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the more skeptical uh, people, they, they want to say, Oh, okay, well, you know, every one of these, here, here's a case where we've got a video clip of a bear walking on its hind legs for, you know, 32.5 seconds. So, you know, we now know this explains all Sasquatch sightings and dog man sightings. Well, no, it doesn't. You know, this is, there's a huge difference between this, you know, uh, this being captured in, in, you know, low lighting conditions and, and yeah, it looks strange, but, you know, then you've got, oh, here's an account of, of three people who saw this bipedal canid creature running, you know, on two legs for a mile. You know, what? what is this? You know, this is a different thing. So it, it really kind of irritates me when the skeptics tend to do it more. You know, they, they want to lump everything in and, and find one singular explanation no, we found this one case we can't explain. That explains them all. Well, no, it doesn't. No, you're, you're, you're being very selective, and you're only taking, you know, what fits your paradigm to try to explain it away. Um, probably from, you know, fear or denial or whatever it is. But, you know, these werewolf accounts, man, they're, they're very strange. I, I know some areas of the country, there seem to be a lot of them pouring out, you know, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, some of those areas. Uh, there's just a lot of these accounts of dogmen cropping up. And honestly, like I said before, you know, myself and some of my colleagues were, were just not sure what to make of it yet. 
question coming from Gnome Squatch in our chat room. David, what is the most <laughs> commonly reported cryptid to you? Oh, probably oh Sasquatch. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, simply because I, I think that is probably the most reported cryptid overall. Uh, beyond that, oh, um, probably probably various water creatures. You know, I. I um, yeah, I seem to get a lot of those you know, people seeing anomalous things in lakes and rivers and, and the ocean. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any particular cryptid that, uh, yeah, I, I, I think not. It's, I mean, it's, it's Sasquatch by and far, you know, overall in general terms. Do you ever get sick of investigating some of these different creatures? Like, the obscure ones have to be fun where you're trying really hard to find that information. But at times, is there, is there something like with Sasquatch because of the popularity or Dogman because of the popularity that you just say, you know what, I'm going to take a break from some of this stuff right now because this is just getting out of hand with the way everything's on social media and nobody's listening to each other to try and improve anything. What's your thoughts? I, I never get frustrated in getting the accounts, uh, you know, that are sent to me. Now, part of that might be because people know I have a, a broad range of interests within the field. So, you know, uh, I get accounts, you know, I'll, I'll get a, a gnome account one day and, you know, a werewolf story the next and, you know, Sasquatch the next. So, you know, I, I get lots of different kinds of reports, but no, none of them ever frustrate or aggravate me. I, I, I find them all very intriguing and, um, you know, and I'll throw in people, if you're listening and you have some weird account of, of gnomes or, you know, water creatures or werewolves or whatever, go to my website, go to the contact area and, and feel free to shoot me a message and tell me your story. Uh, might end up in a book. You never know. Uh, but no, I, I don't get, uh, I, I don't get frustrated at them. I, I, the unusual ones are a lot of fun simply because, you know, it's so cool. The, the, the giant turtle story, you know, this is a cool story. You know, there's, there's a, a finite point that it reaches because you think, okay, well, this is everything. There haven't been any other sites uh, unless, and, but who knows, you know, somebody in Indiana might see a giant turtle tomorrow and report it. You just never know. Uh, but those types of things, we do have a finite amount of information to, um, to consider, you know, when we look at the story and those are fun too. And it's, and it's an important part, I think of, uh, keeping a record of this incredible lore that is, is all over the world, you know, and that's, I'm just kind of with my books sort of trying to do my part in keeping some of these things around and in as pure a form as I can discern, because I investigate these things myself. I, I do a lot of research. I talk to people and I really try to get, you know, all the facts straight and get as much information as I can about these things and get it recorded. So that, you know, somebody uh, a month, a year, you know, 50 years from now can hopefully look back at that text and say, oh, here we go. You know, Weatherly said this and this and this. And, uh, and gosh, we just had a string of giant turtle fighting. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Gonna, I hear you, my uh, friend. Yeah, I hear what you happened there. Then, so. <laughs> David, I want to say thank you so much for coming on Spaced Out Radio again tonight. And we will talk to you near the end of June, man. Appreciate it. Sounds good, man. Uh, take care of yourself. You too. David Weatherly, everybody. His website, eerielights.com. Make sure you check out his books at eerielights.com. You definitely want to do that for yourself. The Newswire and the Thought of the Day next on Spaced Out Radio. If you like it hot, real hot, then heat up your meals with Bumblefoot Hot Sauce. Get your Bumblefoot hot sauce today. The sauce, Bumblelicious, and the 4 million Scoville unit, Bumble f- we're going in hot, real hot, coming out even hotter. Keep the milk nearby. And tantalize your taste buds tonight. Bumblefoot hot sauce, available now at kajons.com. At spacedoutradio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news 
with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Hi there, this is the paranormal lawyer, Michael W. Hall. I'd like to invite you to listen in each Sunday night where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. Need that weekend's supernatural fix? Look no further than Spaced Out Saturday right here at spacedoutradio.com. I'm Stacy Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Each Saturday night, Stacy and I are going to bring you the best in paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, you name it, and we're going there. It's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you. So tune us in every Saturday night on Spaced Out Saturdays starting at 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. Hey Spaced Out Radio fans, it's John Rezig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. Our goal is to make the life of veterans, first responders, and those with rare medical conditions 10% happier. We do this by donating one grant item, ranging from dance to therapy programs to prosthetic limbs, to those who need it most. To contribute to Spaced Out Radio's official charity, head over to chivecharities.org and become a donor today. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great form for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Cold drinks, great food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just $6.95. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes, it's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver, the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hello, Space Travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at YouTube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? 
Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience has proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. So for more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Great to have all of you with us. I want to remind you that if you miss most of this show or others, you can check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot. And don't forget to read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire and so much more. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio for the show and my personal handle at Dave Scott SOR. Speaking of the news, it's that time once again where we get to the weird, the strange, the WTF with Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR news. Why aren't the back end of every show where we get to the weird, the strange, the wacky, and the sometimes astral mysteries? For millions of people around the globe, the new normal has been staying inside with minimal, if any, contact with other humans. For many people coping with this new normal, it's difficult. But some have figured out a way that helps them deal with the isolation. Astral projection. Yes, many people have shared their experiences using astral projection to escape isolation. The way they described it is somewhere between a lucid dream and a near-death experience. Astral projection is the sensation of separating from your physical self, keeping your mind awake while your body is asleep. A quick search on Google or YouTube reveals thousands of people talking about their astral projection experiences. Yes, Wikipedia, and we, we know we can trust this source, describes it this way. Astral projection or astral travel is a term used in esotericism to describe an intentional out-of-body experience that assumes the existence of a soul or consciousness called an astral body that is separate from the physical body and capable of traveling outside and throughout the universe. During this time in quarantine, because of the pandemic, many people are reporting extremely vivid dreams during normal sleep cycles, and this will continue until we decide that we want to get back to normal again. Back in fall of 2019, social media was a buzz about the possible storming of Area 51, an outlandish semi-serious proposal wherein vast crowds of curious citizens might invade Nevada's top secret military base in order to see them aliens, or something like that. Now, the bill has come due, and the ill-fated venture ended up costing a cash-strapped Lincoln County just under $200,000. The dollar amount was calculated by Lincoln County's Emergency Management Director, Eric Holt. Yes, apparently Holt reported the total cost to the county at the commission's April 6th meeting. Mystery Wire who is reporting on this, said many times on the storming Area 51 event in early March, the county commission began talks on how to handle a proposed second event in Rachel, the community closest to the gates to the military base. Commissioners delayed voting on the declaration expressing opposition to any similar events in 2020, but will take it up again later, according to George Arnew, a vocal opponent of the event who attended the March meeting. Arnew 
Resort's website, dreamlandresort.com, has posted his opposition since last year's event. Lincoln County wants to hear from promoters before ruling out music events or any kind of repeat of last year's Facebook-inspired event. Holt told the commissioners that $127,511 was spent on food, fuel, and direct support. Sheriff's Department labor cost times came in at just under forty two grand. That's just over ten thousand for county planning, fifty seven hundred for the building department, forty three hundred and change for supplies and equipment, and just under twenty one thousand dollars for emergency management and the fire district. Lincoln County commissioners hope they won't have to foot the entire bill. They said they will be asking the state for help. Also reported, Commissioner uh, Chairman Varlin Higby in twenty twenty, the county will not go through that again. If anybody, like Connie West of the Little Alien or George Harris at the Alien Research Center in Heiko, want to do something, they will have to pay for what is needed. They will have to do it themselves. Oh, that's not nice. But but you know what? The county will accept the tourism revenue that is brought by this. Of course they will. You know, I mean, why wouldn't they? Free money, but you know what? People will have to pay. Come on, everybody chips in on this. And nobody got to see them damn aliens anyways. Canada's Public Health Authority says around 1 million KN95 respirators that were acquired from China have failed to meet federal COVID-19 standards for use by frontline health professionals. Good job, government. As a result, the federal government did not dispense the non-complying masks to equipment-hungry provinces and territories, said Eric Morissette, a spokesperson for the Public Health Agency of Canada. The failure of these respirators to meet Canada's requirements is yet another challenge for the country, as it fights to separate PPE and medical supplies amid what has become a ferocious global competition. The KN95 is a Chinese model similar to N95, which is a crucial type of personal protection protective equipment used to defend nurses, doctors, and other health workers in the fight against COVID-19. In general, Canada has authorized the KN95 for use as part of the response, but individual shipments are being inspected. China has become the source of around 70% of Canada's imports of PPE, which much, with much of the rest of it coming from the United States, the UK, and Switzerland. The international race for medical gear, fueled by shortages around the world, has led countries to connect with new suppliers and manufacturers, Morissette said. The Public Health Agency of Canada, he added, has been verifying the quality of purchased and donated supplies to ensure they meet federal technical specifications. To date, PHAC has identified approximately 1 million K95 masks as non-compliant with specifications for healthcare settings. Morissette said in a statement, Canada's effort to extract PPE and medical supplies from China has run into complications. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said two airplanes sent to China to pick up shipments of badly needed medical pro- products were forced to return to Canada empty on Monday. Trudeau cited transportation delays on the ground and strict rules that limited how long planes were permitted to wait at Shanghai's airport, a statement that the Chinese government has disputed. A spokesperson for Procurement Minister Anita Anand said four flights carrying N95 respirators, surgical masks, and coveralls and testing reagent from China managed to arrive in Canada last weekend with their cargo. The government has been expecting more plane loads to land in Canada this week. Yes. But we're a first world nation. Don't have them. Go figure that. Four tigers and three lions have now been confirmed at the Bronx Zoo in New York City as testing positive for coronavirus, bringing the total to eight big cats that have come down with the disease. Earlier this month, the zoo announced that Nadia, a four-year-old Malayan tiger, had confirmed to be infected with coronavirus after she and at least six other cats began exhibiting symptoms. Nadia's diagnosis was the first time to our knowledge that a wild animal has gotten sick from COVID-19 from a person. Paul Calley, the chief veterinarian of the Bronx Zoo, said veterinary staff at the zoo collected samples from Nadia's nose, throat, and respiratory tract while she was under anesthesia. The other animals who developed a cough, three other tigers, Tigers from the Tiger Mountain section of the zoo and three African lions were not placed under anesthesia. Oh, no. 
Instead, veterinary staff examined their fecal samples, which were processed by a lab. Lab tests confirmed that the animals were infected indeed. One other tiger at Tiger Mountain who did not develop a cough also tested positive, according to the zoo. The zoo said that all eight cats continue to do well and are behaving normally, eating well, and their coughing is greatly reduced. Zoo officials say they believe the animals were infected by an asymptomatic staff member who unwittingly passed the virus to them. The zoo conducted its analysis of the animals in conjunction with the New York State Diagnostic Laboratory at Cornell University and the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab at the University of Illinois College of Veterinary Medicine. We tested the tigers and lions out at an abundance of caution and will continue to ensure the knowledge we gain about COVID-19 will contribute to the world's continuing understanding of this novel virus, said zoo officials. The testing of these cats was done in veterinary laboratories and resources used did not take from those being used for human testing. Zoo officials said that none of the snow leopards, cheetahs, clouded leopards, Amer leopards or pumas were showing any signs of the illness, which is good. The zoo had to put a place preventive measures for all staff members caring for the animals. Stargazers around the world, are in, and including many Britons, have witnessed unusual constellations made up of low-Earth orbit spacecraft. SpaceX has been launching large batches of satellites as part of its Starlink project to improve global Internet coverage. The most recent launch took place this past Wednesday. Responding to a question about the brightness of the Starlink satellites on Twitter, Elon Musk said that it was due to the angle of the star- satellite solar panels, and the company was fixing it now. A fix couldn't make them less visible from Earth. SpaceX Starlink's project aims to eventually create a network of 12,000 satellites that beam broadband internet access back to Earth. Many of the satellites that are visible now were sent up in March, but their current orbital position has made them easier to see over the past few days. These satellites are also particularly bright because of their size and their proximity to the Earth. Large satellites are usually sent into higher orbit. Low-orbit satellites are usually smaller. Starlink satellites have a wide flat panels and they all reflect light. SpaceX is working on a sunshade that will reduce reflection of satellites sent for future launches. According to astronomers, the visibility of the satellites now is less of a problem for them as it will be as constellations grow and become operational. Currently, the spacecraft are in a parked orbit, but over the next few months, the craft will be used on board engines to move slightly further from Earth and rotate their solar panels towards the sun. That will make them less visible to the naked eye, but it could mean that they cause light pollution for astronomers trying to take pictures of farther reaches of space. Astronomers' cameras are designed to take pictures of really faint things, and bright light could ruin that data, explained Dr. Jonathan McDowell, an astronomer at the Center of Astrophysics. Research Center at Harvard. I applaud the fact that SpaceX has really been trying to find ways to make them less bright. But Dr. McGowell says that there is another problem with the launch of so many new low orbit satellites, increased traffic. The grown number of low orbit aircraft or spacecraft, increases the possibility of crashes between objects which could damage machines or send materials falling back to Earth. From the U category... A Nigerian hospital has announced that a 68-year-old woman has successfully given birth to twins after three previous in vitro fertilization procedures were unsuccessful. The Lagos University Teaching Hospital announced Margaret Adenuga gave birth to a boy and a girl via cesarean session section after 37 weeks of pregnancy. The hospital said the babies were delivered April 14th, but officials waited to announce the news to give the mother and newborns time to recuperate. Adenuga's husband, Noah, who is 77 years old, said the couple married in 1974 and have had long aspired to have children, but three previous rounds of IVF were unsuccessful. Doctors who presided over the delivery said a team of specialists were assembled to monitor the pregnancy and assist with the birth. As an elderly woman and a first-time mother, it was a high-risk pregnancy, and also because she's going to have twins, but we were unable to manage her pregnancy to term. A 73-year-old Indian woman who gave birth to twins in 2019 is believed to be the oldest person to carry a child to term. I don't know how I feel about this. 
You know, I mean, it's great that they're able to have children for the first time. They've been married for 40 plus years and it's great. But at their age, I don't know, maybe who am I to judge? Who am I to judge? I wouldn't want to be a father at 68 years old again. No, sirree. I mean, remember Tony Randall married that 20 at 77 years old, married that 28 year old girl or girl woman. Okay. And then he had kids. And like he was around for like a couple of years and then he died. I wouldn't want that for my children. Children need a father and a mother to be there for them. You know, it's hard enough to live without accidents and disease. I don't know. Just me. Just me. Not happy about it. Anyways, Florida man. Tried to deter authorities last week by placing makeshift sign on his door that claimed he was infected with coronavirus. Joshua Price was arrested on April 16th by officers who discovered the handwritten sign written in blue ink that read, Infected since April 8th, 20. Police said they wore full protective gear when taking him into custody. Placing a fake COVID-19 sign on your door will not stop us from kicking it in when you have felony warrants for your arrest. The Putnam County Sheriff's Office wrote on their social media pages. An investigation into the suspect discovered the sign was created by Price so he could potentially avoid arrest. He had been wanted on several warrants. Price was taken into custody for fleeing and eluding law enforcement and violating his probation, according to the sheriff's office. They added that there was no indication Price had been exposed to the virus. Of course not. Thought of the Dave happens every night at this time where we post a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages, then read your responses on the air because we love the audience participation around here. Today's Thought of the Dave is as follows. What mysterious cryptid creature has the best chance at being real? Tell me why! Marty. It's kind of a weird-looking clown tonight at hashtag Spaced Out Radio on Twitter. Bigfoot. Because there are enough eyewitness accounts and stories about them that go back centuries with Native Americans. Joe. Hamadryads theorized to be nymphs part of a tree, while some believe they are the actual tree, an entity with a spirit. An indigenous belief is to visit a very old tree, make an offering while touching it with respect, and asking it to reveal one of its memories in your dreams. Kevin. Sasquatch. The legend has been around before it was a legend. Too many accounts for centuries to have no uh, to have some validity, and most likely it responds to seasons other like others hibernating, migrating, which increases the chance of it not being found. Shanna, I want to believe the legend of the Kelpies. And surviving pleosaurs, plesiosaurs, pardon me, that live in Loch Ness. Amy, I think all of them are truly plausible. The kraken of giant squids was once thought to be that of only legend. Very true, Amy. Stephen, oh no, we're not getting into that. That's a that's a personal shot at someone. Julie, Sasquatch, but it would probably depend on what you mean by real. I've seen one, she says. Dominic, a Dave Scott, realist if there ever was one. Oh, come on. Come on. Alien big cats in the UK, according to Eris, there are several pretty good videos of very large cats roaming the countryside. All right, let's move on here, shall we? Yeah, we can do that. Why not? Why not, they say. Let's go to, oh, let's see here. Evan, Sasquatch, more ape, less mythic, just really good at hide and seek. Daryl, Bigfoot, because he can phase shift. Marianne, Loch Ness Monster, because it's a giant eel. Michael, Sasquatch, I have seen them three times at very close range. Lou, all of them. If you can imagine it, it's most likely it exists here or elsewhere in the universe. Sparky, 
Bigfoot because I believe I heard the howl one evening sitting on my porch in the woods in Alaska. Only that one time. Never heard it again. Another time I went out back and I intensely felt like I was being watched. Never could figure out what that was all about. Maybe Bigfoot? Uh, Nicholas. I would say the Mokili Mabembe because that Congo is thick as hell and could hide something that massive. The locals have talked about it for generations, and it seems like a place where something like that would be able to avoid being found fairly well. David, Sasquatch, Patricia, Sasquatch is real again. See them up close. William, simply because of the potential for the recovery of physical evidence of its influence on the environment, Bigfoot. Tim is also for Sasquatch. Kelly, Megalodon. We know more about the moon than we do about the ocean. That speaks volumes. We don't know what's in the deep. Fisher folklore are finding more and more weird creatures in the ocean, and we know that the Meg existed at one point, so it makes sense to me that it could still be out there. Ad Gnome. The Gnome Tiny People Birthday Party Hats, Dave's Nightmares. No, Dave is one with the gnomes. Joe, most evidence supports Bigfoot and the Siberian Yeti, but I like to think the sea serpents and lake monsters are real. Gabe, Bigfoot, Bigfoot for Jim. Cassandra, I don't know if this country, but Faye are real, very real, and they're little buggers too, waking me up in the middle of the night, then flitting away. Bill wants to see Mothman. And John gets the final word here. Jabba Fofi with 500 million acres who really knows what lurks in the rainforest of the Congo or other areas in the world that matter. Thank you to everybody participating in the Thought of the Day. We will do it all again tomorrow on Facebook and Twitter. And then we also want to thank Captain Shirk for putting together a fantastic SOR Newswire tonight. Good job, Captain. And to David Weatherly, EerieLights.com is his website. Make sure you check out his books, especially his Woodknock series. Highly, highly worth it. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is Watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thanks to everyone participating in our chat rooms tonight on the SOR Space Travelers Club on our website. Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. You snarkers and snarkettes were beautiful. Spreaker, YouTube, LGAB, Revolution Radio, and on Facebook. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. I want to say a big thank you to each and every one of you for tuning us in tonight. You made it a lot of fun because together, my friends, say it with me. We're watching. We own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Have a great night, everybody. I look forward to hanging out with all of you again tomorrow. We'll see you then. Good night.